Today we're going to be looking at the Christian race. I think you know that much. We're going to look at it from Hebrews chapter 12, which is immediately following the um, uh, chapter that I just read. And we're going to look just basically at the first four verses and primarily at uh, the first two. But let me go ahead and read that for you as, as we begin. The author to the Hebrews writes, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Well, may the Lord bless his word to um, our edification uh, this morning. Well, this morning we come to our last uh, hero in this year's uh, Reformation series. We're going to be looking, as I've told you, at Eric Little, who not only won a gold medal in the 1924 Olympics in the 400-meter event, but went on to serve Jesus Christ on the mission field uh, in China. And of course, as we think about Eric Little, how can we miss uh, uh, the fact that um, you know, this reminds us that we also are running a race, that we are also called to run the same race that he ran, not the one where he, he ran, uh, won the 400 meters, but his life, the life that he lived for the glory and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian life is more than once in Scripture likened to a race, and it is a race that Jesus calls all of us to run. Now, so far we've seen in this series why we should run this race, and Actually, the author to the Hebrews is going to remind us of the same thing this morning. Because there is one who loved us and who ran this race, first of all, for us, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He obeyed his Father. He laid down his life in order that he might save us so that we might be able to enter the race and that we might have the strength that we need to be able to run this race to its end. Now, we've seen that to run this race, we have to be able to overcome certain things that get in our way. This is that part of spiritual discipline. We, we need to, to put off the things that rob us of spiritual power. We need to be able to fight and overcome our flesh. The world, and of course the devil who is working against our flesh and using the world in order to do this. Jesus did the work that he did. He ran the race that he did all the way to the end so that he would be able to give us the ability through his Holy Spirit to run this race and to overcome these enemies. We've seen that the more successful we are in overcoming our enemies, the more we're going to grow in that particular virtue that we need, uh, perhaps more than some of the others, and that is courage. And we've seen why courage is so important. And that's because fear, more than anything else, is that which keeps us from doing what it is our Lord calls us to do in this race. To live, to live like Jesus, to, to stand out from the crowd, to be as lights in this world, and to be lights by more than just our lives, but also by our words, to share the Lord Jesus Christ with others on all of this that we might glorify God. We need courage to do this. We need to be able to overcome our reluctance and our fear. And the way we do that, of course, is by fighting our enemies, putting off the things that rob us of power. And we do this all because of the love of Christ. Now this morning, I want us to consider three things from our text that I think will help us to um, better be able to do this, to run this race, to fight in this battle. First of all, the reminder that we are all called to run in this race. I mean, we, we need to remember this was not a race that just the apostles were to run. This is something that all of us are called to run. Secondly, how we are to run that we may win. There are certain things we must do. If we are to make progress, it's not automatic. It is a struggle. And finally, the encouragements the Lord has given to us. 
that show us that it's not only possible to win this race, but if we fix our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we actually will win. We will cross the finish line. So first of all, let's be reminded that we are all called to run. The author to the Hebrews writes in verse 1, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And I think it goes without saying, the author to the Hebrews in addressing this to his audience is referring to all of them, including himself, let us run. Now the race, as I've already told you, is living the life Jesus calls us to live. It's living according to his standard, doing what Jesus would do in everything, in every circumstance, with this one particular goal in mind, which is the goal that we should always be striving after, giving as much glory to God as we possibly can in the few years that we have to live. Now, the Christian life is likened to a race to remind us that it is, in some respects, a competition. We're not competing against each other. We're not trying to outdo one another, as it were, and sort of blow by one another as we rush towards the finish line. The Bible says there's really only one area in which we are to compete with one another, and that is in trying to outdo one another in showing honor to each other. The one who does that, the one who humbles himself to be the servant of all, to show honor to others, to serve others, he is the one who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. It's especially that latter statement, which is literally translated, try to outdo one another in showing honor to one another. The competition in this race is not against each other, but it is against those things that we were just reminded that the enemy uses to try to stop us in our tracks, to keep us from making forward progress. The more we can keep ourselves free from those influences of the flesh, the world, and the devil, the more progress we will make. It's also a race against the clock because all of us only have so much time that the Lord has given to us and we are to try to use it as best we can to advance towards our goal, which is giving glory to God. And I would say the authors of the Hebrews and Paul liken this, the Christian life to a race because the effort that we are to put into running it. If you watch people on the track, you know, when they're running in the way that they're supposed to be running in a competition, uh, you'll notice that they don't just walk when, they, uh, when the firing, you know, the, the gun goes off. They don't just stroll forward, but they run. I mean, look at the Apostle Paul's life. Would you say that his life could better be described as walking or running? Was he just puttering around and doing what it is that the Lord had called him to do, or was he striving forward and putting forth his very best effort to serve and honor his Lord? Well, you know it's the latter. Now, the fact that it requires a great deal of effort is also why this race requires endurance. The word basically means patience, steadfastness, sticking to the course with a confident expectation that we are going to cross the finish line if we do not give up. We need to run with patience. We need to run with steadfastness. We need to stick to the course and not give up. Paul uses, as we've already noted, a similar analogy of the Christian life when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9.24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? <clears throat> run in such a way that you may win. That's the kind of effort we are to put into this. Now, we are all called to run. We are all called to pursue God's glory in our lives, with our lives, putting our whole effort into it. We are to run as one who is competing to win the prize, that is to be first, as it were, in this race. And again, remembering that doesn't mean we're trying to outstrip one another. Being first in this race means you humble yourself to serve others, but you do it better than anybody else does it. 
Now, secondly, the author tells us how we are to run in order that we may win. How can we run this race with this kind of effort and this kind of endurance? Well, first of all, he says we must be willing to set aside the things that get in our way, and there are many things that do. He says in verse 1, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. Now, the word encumbrance means weight, things that are heavy. It refers to anything that can hinder us, that can get in our way. Now, again, looking at the analogy of a race, when you see the, the people who are in the race lining up at the, uh, at the beginning, at the start, when you look at them, you'll note that they don't have weights fastened to their wrists or ankles. You know, they might use those in training, ankle weights, wrist weights, and so forth, but they don't wear them when they're running because they're going to get in their way. You'll notice that, that the clothing that they're wearing is not baggy, and it's certainly not binding. And their shoes are not thick and heavy and inflexible. You see them dressed as lightly and loosely as possible so that their clothing doesn't get in the way. Now, A.T. Robertson, uh, he's, he's a, a Greek scholar, I think, from the last century and has written a Greek grammar that is the biggest grammar that has ever been written. He also has a book called Word Pictures of the New Testament, which is a very, very interesting book and very insightful. But he says that in the games that the author to the Hebrews here is describing, the athletes basically competed wearing next to nothing. And he may have said that only to make it more palatable because some of these events were actually done without any clothing, you see, because the clothing got in the way. Now, he's not advocating that we do that, but obviously in the Christian race, there are certain things we need to set aside. Now, what he's talking about is the setting aside of anything that is going to get in our way, that is going to hinder us from running this race. And he, you notice that he uses two categories here, uh, the things that hinder and the sin that entangles us. And what he's pointing us to here is the idea that something can get in the way, even if it's not sinful in and of itself. Something doesn't have to be forbidden in Scripture for it to become a hindrance or a snare to us. As a matter of fact, anything can become like that if it has too much influence in our lives. Anything can become sinful if it gets in our way of serving God. That's why Jesus put his finger on the rich young ruler and remember his, his wealth. He said, one thing you lack, sell all your possessions, give it to the poor and come and follow me. Why did he tell that man to do that particular thing and yet he doesn't call everyone to do at least physically get rid of all these things even though we all must be willing to do that. It's because he had great possessions. Those possessions possessed his heart. He loved those things. He didn't want to give them up, and they were a snare to him. Anything can become an idol to us if we love it too much. Anything can hold us back if we're not willing to let go of it. I would remind you of what Susanna Wesley said when she was teaching her sons John and Charles as they were growing up. She said this, whatever weakens your reason impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes off the relish for spiritual things, then it is sin for you, however innocent it may be in itself. I remember one of my professors in college said, a chocolate milkshake, drinking a chocolate milkshake can be sin if you believe it's a sin to drink it. You see, whatever is not done in faith can be sin. That's one thing to think about. But another thing to think about is this. Whenever something has such a hold on you that it keeps you from doing what God calls you to do, that becomes sin also for you. And that's what the author to the Hebrews is talking about here. Whatever hinders us, whatever gets in our way, if we want to win, we must be willing to let go of those things that are holding us back. Now, secondly, he says we must put away what hinders us the most, which is actual sin, especially those sins that we are liable to, the sin that so easily entangles us. He says again in verse 1, let us also lay aside the sin which so easily entangles us. Now, Paul writes to Timothy in his second letter in chapter 2, verse 5, something very similar. 
He says also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. We need to lay aside the sin. And what is sin but the breaking of the rules or the commandments? And we need to compete according to the rule. In other words, we need to walk in obedience to the Lord. Now, God has given us rules for the race. He's actually given us ten. If we are to win, we have to stick to them. Because if we don't, we won't win. Now, here I think Eric Little is, is a sterling example and this is what he is primarily remembered for, perhaps more than anything else that he did. And that was his refusal to compete in the Olympics on the Lord's Day. He was Scottish Presbyterian. Presbyterians have the same standard that this church has, the Westminster Confession. And if you've ever read the section on the commandments, and the fourth commandment in particular, you'll see that one thing you're not to do is work or, or do recreational things uh, worldly recreations is, is specifically, not that you can't have recreation. Well, competing in, in an athletic event, that is something that is against the whole spirit of the Sabbath, which is a day to rest and to worship the Lord. He was not willing to compromise what the Lord had told him to do. And because of that, because of his unwillingness to compromise, he was not able to participate in the event that was his best event, his best chance, humanly speaking, of winning gold and glory for himself. I mean, you ever watch the Olympics? You see the people that are standing in the first place with the gold? I mean, everybody's happy to be on the podium, but particularly the one who has the gold. I think if you were in the event, you would like gold as well. Well, he had to give up the gold, you see, in order to do that. But don't forget, not just for himself, but also for his country. His country was counting on that gold. And by the way, uh, contrary to the movie Chariots of Fire, he didn't learn it on the boat going over to France. He didn't have just a few days to make this choice or even just a day. He actually knew a couple of months in advance. And because he knew that, he let them know in advance that he wasn't going to run. And he began training for another event that he thought he could run, which is the 400 meter, even though up to this point, he hadn't done that well in it. But in his stand not to run on the Sabbath also excluded him from another event where he and his team likely would have gained the gold, and that was the 4 by 400 meter relay. Now, Little was able to do this because he wasn't looking for the, the honor and the glory that comes from this world, but he was looking for that honor and glory which comes from God and the Lord honored him for his stand. If he had won that gold in the uh, event he would originally run in, we probably would have forgotten him. <laughs> but we remember him because of that stand. And we remember him because of the way the Lord honored him in other ways. He did run the 400 meter and he won, even though this was not his best event. And when he ran it, he set a new European record that would stand for the next 12 years. That's how the Lord honored him. By the way, he honored him in many ways by the rest of his life in allowing him to serve him on the mission field and suffer for his glory. By the way, it's interesting, before he ran the race, uh, you'll know in the movie, if you've seen Chariots of Fire, Jackson Schultz, one of the American runners, hands him a note and he reads the note and that encourages him. Uh, even though Schultz is not running in the race, he is running against somebody who was on Schultz's American team. But apparently it wasn't Schultz that gave him this note at all, but it was handed to him by one of the staff that would take care of the athletes uh, before they would go run. And the note said this, in the old book it says, he that honors me, I will honor, wishing you the best of success always. So Little was encouraged by that. He was encouraged that not only his coach, but also this member of the team agreed with the stand that he had taken, a stand which he already knew was pleasing to the Lord. Now we know it's pleasing to the Lord from his word. We know what pleases him, but it is encouraging when our brothers and sisters come around us and, and encourage us and say, you know what, you're doing the right thing. And so he did the right thing. The Lord blessed him. Now if we are to run so that we also may win, we must be willing to lay aside every sin and to live a life without compromise, a life that is honoring to the Lord. 
Now, thirdly, the only way we can do this is if we look to Jesus. The author writes in, in verse 2, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have to fix our eyes upon Jesus. We need to follow his example. We need to look away from what the world has to offer, its fame and its fortune. Again, little still got a bit of that, but he, he could have very well handed it all over and given it all up in order to serve his Lord, and that still would have been the best trade. We have to be willing to turn our eyes away from that and set our eyes on that which is to come, the world which is to come, on the rewards that we will receive from the Lord for doing what is honoring and pleasing to him, but particularly we need to fix our eyes upon that one who loves us and that one whom we love more than any other, and that would be our precious Lord, Jesus. Now, why should we do that? Well, first of all, because of who He is. He is the one who is lovely. He is the one who is the center of our hearts and our affections, the one we love more than anyone else, because He is beautiful, He is lovely. Uh, We need to fix our eyes on Him because of His great love for us. I mean, He loved us so much that he was willing to do what was necessary to do to save us. The author to the Hebrews calls him the author of our faith. And what he means by that is that he is the one who obeyed for us. He is the one who died for us, that he might save us from hell. Remember Newton, amazing grace, saved a wretch like me? Well, we are all wretches, and the Lord in his mercy and grace saved us. He became the author of salvation. He is the author of faith also in the sense that he is the one who sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts to quicken our dead souls to life. He is the author of this new life in us so that we would be able to believe in the Lord Jesus, so that we could believe in him. And notice the author says he is also the perfecter of our faith. He is the one who has promised that the work that he has begun, he will complete. Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 1 verse 6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it. He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The author to the Hebrews tells us we should fix our eyes upon Jesus because he is the one who has not only the ability to begin our salvation, but he is the one who will also bring it to its conclusion. We will cross the finish line. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And we should look to Jesus because he is our example. He already ran this race, remember, and he won. He didn't look to the world, he didn't look for its glory and its fame, but he looked to the world which was coming, the joy that was set before him. And fixing his eyes on that joy, he ran this race, he ran it all the way to the cross. Notice, not enjoying the shame that it brought, but on the other hand, not letting it stop him as he raced towards heaven. And the glory that was waiting for him there as he was crowned the Lord of creation. The author to the Hebrews wants particularly to draw our attention to the example that our Lord Jesus Christ has left us in verses 3 and 4. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood, in your striving against sin. Now, our Lord knows that the way is difficult. He knows because he experienced it himself, such hatred uh, by sinners against him. His race, his warfare against the enemy of our souls, the devil, took him all the way to the cross and the shedding of his own blood so that we would be free from our sins. Now, Jesus is not calling us to do anything that he hasn't already done. Consider him. 
you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. That is, you haven't been persecuted to that point. You haven't given your life as he did. Well, he was willing to do that, and he calls us to be willing to do that as well. Considering the end that our Lord obtained and what he promises us. And so as the Father strengthened Jesus to run his race to its end, he wants us to know that he also stands ready to strengthen us to run this race to the end if we will only look to him and trust him to do it. Now finally, consider the encouragements that he has given us in this race. The first encouragement is Jesus is the author of our faith. He, he gave it to us as a free gift and he is the finisher of it. He will bring it to completion. If he has begun that work, he will complete it if we only trust him. That's a tremendous encouragement. By the way, encouragement means to give us courage to keep going on. And we're looking at how we can have more courage. Well, look at Jesus. He's promised that you're going to make it to the end. That should give us more courage than just about anything else. But I want you to notice, too, that the author to the Hebrews and our Lord, through him, has given us many more examples. You might say the author to the Hebrews recorded them, but Jesus is the one who actually made them examples to us. He has helped others actually make it to the finish line. Now, the race would be much more difficult if we were the first to run it, if nobody else had made it to the line, right? All these years and years of, of people trying to make it to heaven and nobody making it. And he says, all right, now you run the race. Now you try it. Well, how encouraged are you going to be that you're going to make it if all these other people failed? But what if there's a whole group that made it and they made it because they were trusting the Lord? Well, there are many who did. And the author to the Hebrews points us to them. He points us to Jesus, the one who endured this hostility against himself. But he pointed to all these others also who have trusted him and have made it. And that's what the author to the Hebrews is referring to in verse 1 when he said this. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Again, he's referring to those examples he gave to us in Hebrews 11. Of those who ran this race by faith, and actually completed the race and made it to the finish line. He tells us that we should consider what their lives have to say about this. Remember Abel, though he is dead, yet he still speaks. All of these are still speaking to us today. And they're all telling us that the life of faith is the one that we need to live. That it's worth it. It's worth whatever price we have to pay, whatever Jesus tells us that we have to give up. And actually our Lord tells us that the price is high. I mean, Eric Little found it high. He had to give up earthly glory. He had to give up many things, we'll see, when he gets into China, and particularly when the Japanese attack China, and he's put into a Japanese concentration camp. There are things we must be willing to endure. Jesus tells us in Luke 9, verses 23 through 25, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. By the way, he's talking about the same thing that Paul was talking about in this race. In 1 Corinthians 9, he's talking about the same thing the author to the Hebrews is telling us in Hebrews chapter 12. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself. Again, I, as I said before, Eric Little believed this, which is why he refused to compromise and dishonor his Lord to gain a reward that one day he was going to have to leave behind along with all the other earthly possessions and earthly glory. But he obeyed instead that he might gain some, something that was much more important, and that is the reward that he could never lose. By the way, I think his final words on his deathbed, the last words that he uttered basically summarize it all. He says this, it's complete surrender. Those were his final words. Christian life, the Christian race, um, competing in this, in this warfare that we have to fight, 
Everything the Lord calls us to it can be summarized by these words. It's complete surrender. Complete surrender to the Lord. You don't hold anything back. You don't claim anything as your own. No time, no resources, or, or any gifts. It's, it's all His. And as we look at His life this evening, you're going to see He lives that kind of life. Was He perfect? No. Nobody's perfect but the Lord, right? But was He more advanced in His race than, than we are in ours? I think probably in all of us, which is why we will be encouraged by that example. And from what we've seen of the other documentaries we watched, Knox, Bunyan, Newton, and Spurgeon, do you think they would disagree with, with Eric Little on this? I, th I think they agreed with him because their life was also a life of complete surrender. If you are willing to surrender your life completely to Jesus, if you are willing to turn from your sins and to trust in Jesus Christ alone, He will give you the strength to run this race and to run it to the end. He says through Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 40 verses 28 through 31, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Look to the Lord this morning for His grace, and He will see that you make it to the finish line by His grace. Amen. Let's, uh, let's bow in prayer, and let's ask the Lord to take this, what we've heard, and, and bring it home, as it were, to our souls.